Yo, what up? This is Josh Room from East West Alien Performance. Today, again, same outfit, recorded them all at once. Much easier. I don't need you to tell me I got the same clothes on. We're going to talk about leg length discrepancies part three, and I want to talk about the occiput in relation to the dura. Now I am in the sacrum and the dura. Now I appreciate everyone making their way through these videos. I know it's a lot to take in. My point isn't to completely educate you in 10 to 15 minutes. It's to spark some thoughts so you do some research and you look elsewhere. Now, you can take classes, do whatever you want. Probably the best book I recommend is edition one or three of Osteopathy in the Cranial Field by Harold Magoon, edited by Sutherland. First one is more Sutherland-like, third, fourth, etc., more uh, Magoon-like. But that's going to give you probably the best mechanics of the cranial mechanism itself. Of course, there's other great books, other great courses, but that's my recommendation for this part of this video. Osteopathy in the Cranial Field, edition one or three. So if you look at the occiput, it has a huge relationship to the sacrum via the dura. Now you have your, you know, I've talked about this before, your falx, cerebri, ethmoid, all the way, sagittal sinus, to your inion, which is Sutherland's fulcrum. You have your tentorium uh, cerebri, which is petrous portion to anterior, posterior clenoid processes of the sphenoid, to Sutherland's fulcrum. And then your falx cerebellum, which is more your foramen magnum, Sutherland's fulcrum, um, in that area. So those all meet the Freeman Magnum, the uh, inferior portion of C1, all of C2, and superior portion of C3. Make their way all the way down to S2. That is the cranial sacral mechanism in a sense. So there's a huge relationship between the sphenoid, the occiput, of course other bones like the temporal bones um, because of where they attach, the parietal bones because of the way they attach, occipital condyles, C0, C1, C2, C3, etc that could take a whole you know eight days in itself to explain but there's a huge connection between the occiput occipital bones the cranial you know uh, fascia or the cranial diaphragm some of the cervical spine with the spine itself as well as the sacrum so that's the link so how do you have a leg length discrepancy that's possibly coming from the cranium well of course you'd have to learn how to assess it I can't take the time to do that and teach you this the importance is just to kind of maybe get this out there so you can kind of learn something. So, <clears throat> to simplify it, there's a lot to it. You have the occiput and the sphenoid, okay? On inhalation, this is kind of what happens in a sense. I'm exaggerating it, grossly exaggerating it, and on inhalation, they come back. So we call this cranial flexion, we call this cranial extension. So on inhalation, the occipital kind of goes posterior. It actually moves into mechanical extension, but we call it cranial flexion. And the SBS actually rises, sphenobasilar synchondrosis. It actually rises. The sphenoid, the basi occiput actually goes high, and the greater wings actually goes caudal and low. But the SBS actually rises. That would be a mechanical flexion, we could say. So we call that cr cranial flexion. Flexion. And then cranial extension is exactly the opposite. My goal is not to go into all the mechanics of that. There's three axes. There's a transverse of both where you get your flexion extension. You have your AP axes, uh, I'm sorry, your um, uh, vertical axes um, as well as AP axes. And this is where you get your side bending and your rotation movements. Your rotation movements, the AP axes with those bones and your. Um, um, what do you call it? Your side bending is more through the um, vertical axes. I'm drawing a blank here. But when you side bend and rotate, you're using both axes. So enough about that. But the bottom line is, when you're looking at the sphenoid and the occiput, you can do certain tests and find out are these bones actually in lesion? What are they affecting neurologically? What structures are they affecting? Where is it coming from? There's a lot to it. It's not just these bones are the issue and this is the problem. It could be fascia. It could be arterial. Um, it could be other bones or sutures causing the problem. It could be coming from the facial bones, pharyngeal basal fascia, which have attachments to the basi occiput, and basi sinoid, which is actually part of your tongue. The list goes on. But if you have a right torsion of the SPS, now with a right torsion of the, of the SPS, if this is out of your loop, then you just got to go learn stuff. I'm still learning, so it's still new to me. But just go out there and learn the stuff. With a right torsion of the SPS, the right greater wing of the sphenoid is high, basi occiput is high, on the left it's low. So we call that externally rotated on the right, internally rotated on the left. Because the left or the right 
basi occiput, which you call it from a greater wing, is high. Basi uh, sphenoid, sorry. Basi sphenoid and greater wing are high, so we call that extra rotation. That's how you name a torsion um, by the side of the higher greater wing. Now, if you have a high greater wing on the right and it's low on the left, what you're typically going to see is a low squama of the occiput on the left, high squama on the right. Now, you name the, um, um, what do you call it? the internally, externally uh, rotation part of, this, of the occiput based on the squama. So if the squama is actually low, it's actually an external rotation, and if it's high, it's actually an internal rotation. So based on quadrants of the cranium, we have the right side and the front being more externally rotated, the left front being more internally rotated, the left posterior being more externally rotated, the right posterior being more internally rotated. Now I'm going to read you something from a goon, and then I'll kind of summarize it. And I went over this right torsion for a specific region. So if you have a right torsion, the left squam is going to be low. Left great, the right greater wing is going to be high. So we have extra rotation in the right quadrant and left quadrant. That's a right torsion. Because of the reciprocal tension membranes, kind of what I talked about at the beginning, falx cerebri, cerebelli, tentorum cerebri, um, perverted physiological motion such as sacral torsion is almost invariable accompanied by torsion of the sphenobasilar symphysis, or the SBS. That's from Magoon, sorry, 1976, page 72. If the left hemibase of the sacrum is low, the occiput would be low on the left side as well. If the sacral base is tipped so that one side is posterior and inferior, then the cranium usually goes into torsion with the occiput low on that side. Similarly, if the occiput moves inferiorly on one side with torsion at the symphysis, then the sacral base will be low on the same side and somewhat posterior. So what he's saying is this. I'll kind of summarize it as best as I can. We have the reciprocal tension membranes, what I mentioned. They, if they move, if there's movement, they attach the bone, we're going to see a replication of movement in the sacrum. That's the beginning part because of their connection to the SBS, C0, C1, C2, etc. frame magnum. If the left hemibase of the sacrum is low, the occiput would be low on that side. So if the left hemibase of the sacrum is low, this is the left side, um, it'd be low, so it'd be actually rotated right because the left hemibase is going to go anterior inferior, so it's low on the, on the left. So if the left hemibase is uh, of the sacrum is low, the occiput would be low on the left side as well. So if you have a right on right, where the left hemibase is anterior and inferior and it's low, we're going to have a left occipital squama that's low, which means we have a right torsion of the SBS. So that means if we have a right torsion of the SBS, we're going to have a right torsion of the sacrum. If we have a right torsion in the sacrum, we're probably going to see a right torsion in the SBS. The question is, where is it coming from and what is actually causing what? And that's up to you to decide. Um, if the hemibase or the sacral base is tipped so that one side is posterior, and it, posterior, then the cranium usually goes into torsion with the occiput low on that side. So that would be your non-physiological going backwards. So if the, the one of the base goes, goes posterior, then the cranium usually goes into torsion with the occiput low on that side. So if we had a right rotation on the left axis, then we'd have a left torsion. It's moving on the left axis, it's rotating right, we'd have a left torsion because its hemibase is actually posterior. Similarly, if the opposite moves inferior on one side, so if the occiput moves inferior on one side, the occipital squam is low, that's external rotation. So if it's low on the left, as I mentioned, you have a right torsion. Um, I'm going to rewind. If, similarly, if the occiput moves left, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to read and think at the same time, it's hard. Similarly, if the occiput moves inferior on one side, like I just mentioned, with torsion at the symphysis, then the sacral base will be low on the same side and somewhat posterior, as I just mentioned. So a lot of the times... The sacrum and occiput are always going to follow each other. So if the sacral base is low, the occipital on that side is going to be low, secondary to the reciprocal tension membrane. So to keep it simple, if you have a right torsion, 
right greater wing high, left occipital squama low. That's a right torsion. You're going to have a right on right of the sacrum because the right base is actually anterior and inferior. So you can see which can give you a false long leg discrepancy on the le this left side because it's a physiological lesion of the sacrum. It's not physio non-physiological. It's not non-physiological. It's not rotating backwards. It's rotating forward. So now we have a false long leg discrepancy on the left side, and it actually could be coming from the sphenoid, the occiput, cranial diaphragm, temporals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm tired of talking. Hopefully this makes sense. If it doesn't, great. Do your research. I'm not saying I know it all. I'm just trying to share what I've learned, what I've studied. Probably made some mistakes along the way. That's fine. We learn from them. But do your research and understand that leg net discrepancies are not always coming from the psoas. Think about the anonymate, those axes. Think about the coxomoral joint, their axes. Think about the sacrum, their axes. Think about the SBS, their axes. And think about all those things and what all those bones and axes and fascia ligaments actually interdigitate with. Because as you've seen, an SBS issue can actually cause a sacral issue, which can cause a leg length discrepancy. I'm out of here. Have a good day. Peace.